Welcome, everybody, to Ask Our Vet, back live in the Earth Animal Studios this week. Uh, it's good to be back in the studios. Um, welcome back, everybody, for our loyal and regular listeners. For anybody new, my name is Dr. Chris. I am, for better or worse, your host for Ask Our Vet. Um, I thank everybody. Hey, good fish, thanks for checking in. You made it, you made it home. Good, good. It's always good to... Uh, to see that you're on. Hey Mel, how's it going? Thanks. Oh, hey Krista, yeah. I figured, obviously, to the, the topic this week is um, toxins, right? We're gonna talk some common stuff, uh, toxin-wise, with our, our dogs and cats. Uh, some, a lot of it people know, um, and some of it you may not, you know? So there are certainly common ones that, that most people are aware of, but there are other ones you may not be, and there are other forms of things, as we'll talk, you may be aware of a toxin, but you may sometimes people may not be aware that what that there is that substance in other things. So we're gonna we're gonna go over that. Happy Thursday, Jennifer. Thanks for checking in. Hey Nora, how are you? Hey Marianne, how's Georgia? Oh, thanks, Michael. Yeah, I I'm, I I did comb my hair today just for the show, so I figured why not? We'll spruce up. Same vest, but you know, different, uh, different look with the hair, right? I hope everyone's week is going well. Uh, weekend's coming up. The weather up here has been um, started out crummy, right? Last night up in uh, in um, Fairfield County it was really rainy and cold, and and this morning started out not that great. But my God, the afternoon has been gorgeous. So to be outside, uh, spring's here, guys, and uh, that's good news for all of us. I think get outside. And, uh, you know, with our walking our dogs and it's just, uh, just to have better weather is, is already makes you feel better, right? Uh, let's see who else is checking in. Oh, thanks, Tasha. Yeah, it's actually, you know, for anybody new that's joining us, you know, we've done this weekly since, uh, since COVID started last. So it's, you know, we're really at a year with this. And uh, I have to be honest with you, it's one of my favorite days of the week, too. I love doing it and I love... Uh, with you guys we've had really good interaction over the past several weeks and great questions so um, keep it up keep it up guys so thank you Tasha thanks for tuning in for sure hey Lisa how are you hi Pat oh great good Diane good you got it you have to let us know how you, how you like it absolutely and how it's going hey Aunt Loretta how are you Oh, and hi, Nicole. How you doing? <laughs> All right. So let's let's start. We'll start um, getting into this. So you know, one of the things that and, and Easter's coming up as well. So I think it's always a good time when we, you know when Easter's coming up. A lot of candy around, right? There is plants, right, and certain things. So there's something you know kind of dangerous about Easter and around Easter for our animals, both our dogs and cats. So we thought it was a good time to go over them. Um, and uh, you know, just provide some information and, and hopefully learn something today, right? Hey, Jimmy. Thanks for checking in. Oh, thanks, Jennifer. I, I really do appreciate it. Thank you very much. Hi, Morgan. How was your day? I hope you had a good one. How are the dogs? And how are the cats? Hi, Paula. How's the weather in Florida, Paula? Is it uh? I hope it's nice. It's really, it's been beautiful here. So it's usually that kind of follows. So hopefully it's pretty, uh, it's been pretty good down there as well. Whereabouts in Florida, Paul? So let's start talking, let's start talking toxins. Okay. So what I thought we'd do is we're going to talk, there are certain, obviously there are toxins that they both, both our dogs and cats share. There are toxins that, and poisons that, uh, that, primarily affect dogs. There are toxins and um, poisons that primarily affect cats. Most of them they share, but I'm gonna kind of talk as we go and just kind of tell you which ones I see more commonly with one or the other, all right? 
Um, you know, for instance, obviously, um, and we'll get to that later, but fertilizer that we, we use in the lawns outside and, um, and certain mulch can be toxic to animals, right? Well, primarily that's, we see that with dogs because they're running around the yard, they're eating, you know, they're digging, they're eating dirt, they eat the mulch. Um, it's not as it really a problem with cats, but certainly can be. So there are definitely items that are crossover. We'll talk about them and, uh, you know, kind of talk prevention as well. Oh, good. Say hi to everybody, Morg, for me. Anyway, so one of the more up and coming. So if we had this show, I would say 15 to 20 years ago, this this next thing we're going to talk about might have not even made the list, but it has it has slowly risen year by year on what the poison controls um, report uh, as the most common toxins. And really for both dogs and cats, this is something that can be a problem, and that's medications, okay? And both over-the-counter and prescription, all right? Um, I, I can't tell you how many times, and this can happen to anybody. This has happened at my house. This can happen to anybody. If you are taking a medication and you drop it and one of the animals is right there and they eat it. And this can happen to a dog or a cat. And one of the dangers of this is, um, is that Animals have, you know, while we share a lot with dogs and cats, okay, and we share a lot of physiology and we, there are certain things that are almost mirror image about, um, about us, there are, there are some vast differences too. And, and one, animals in general have much faster metabolisms than people. So they, these, these medications that we have can really, really affect them. Okay. Um, most commonly, with say over the counter for both the uh, for both dogs and cats, is things like pain relievers, right? Ibuprofen, uh, acetaminophen, Tylenol, naproxen, and you know, usually it's very uh, it can be very bad in both dogs and cats, and it's dose dependent. And one of the things it, that you may or may not know about cats is there are very few anti-inflammatories that cats actually can tolerate well, all right? So even a single tablet, if it falls on, falls onto the ground and the cat picks it up can be, can be really, can be devastating to them, you know? What we, what we see oftentimes with dogs is that they, they, they'll get into a bottle, right? They'll grab, you'll, we'll, we'll take a, ibuprofen some you know it, and you'll put the bottle back even put the cat back on but leave it on the edge of the counter okay and I've had many dogs then go and eat numerous pills from that and you know these things can be they can be devastating to their livers they can be devastating to their GI systems um, and kidneys as well depending on the medication so one of the things you're going to hear as a, as a common theme throughout this talk is prevention okay and it's knowing that we have First of all, we know cats can get anywhere basically in the house. So nothing safe on a counter or anything or not a closed cabinet. And if you're like me and you have a dog that pretty much can get anywhere in a counter too, even if you can't really, even if you've never seen them do it, but you know that they've taken things and you can't really quite figure out how they get to places, they can. So prevention is always Proofing your house and prevention is always the key to this, okay? Now, can we prevent every situation? No. We know that we, know that, um, we all have busy lives and, and, you know, oftentimes we're running around, but I think part of this is, and the take-home theme today is going to be, is going to be prevention of, you know, just on a daily basis, just checking and, and just getting yourself in a habit. Oh, if I have a somewhere put away in a cabinet, I have a bottle of ibuprofen and I'm taking, you know, I'm going to take a, an ibuprofen that it's got to go back, closed off back into the cabinet. So, you know, obviously very important. Oh, you're in Destin, Paul? It's, it's raining. Well, hopefully, uh, hopefully that clears. Hopefully it'll be a good weekend. All right. So that's, that's the first thing, the over-the-counters. And like we said, and prescriptions have, prescriptions obviously nationally are on the rise. Uh, some of the biggest prescriptions that we see in both the dogs and the cats, things like antidepressants, you know, anti-seizure medications, uh, and cardiac medications. And, you know, I've had, I've had clients um, call on, on all of these. And again, same type of thing, pill drops on the floor, or they have, a, they have a pill box that's either open and falls off, or that the dog gets to the pill box and eats them. Um, 
And same, same thing applies, okay? And the other thing we're gonna talk about, and we'll talk about it later, is what to do when this happens. And, and it really goes through most of these, okay? We're gonna, we have, we have up on the, um, we have on the Facebook the number for animal poison control. We're gonna put up the AC, ASPCA poison control for you guys. And I will say, again, take home on this. If you have an animal that's eaten something that, and you know they've eaten it, and you're unsure make the phone call to poison control, okay? It does two things. One, there is a fee with these, but it is well worth the fee that you pay because they, e they either can direct you in exactly what to do, all right? They may say sometimes that it may be that the dose is not high enough to cause anything, so you don't have to do anything, but you don't ever want to assume that, oh, it's one pill, it's not a big deal, or it's one, again, we're gonna be talking about food items next, it's one grape, it's no big deal. You, do, you, you cannot assume that. Uh, there are things that are much more toxic in smaller amounts. Uh, grapes and raisins, for instance, which we'll get to in a little bit, can be really, really uh, devastating in relatively small amounts. So you have to be, you really have to be cautious, over cautious, and if they get into anything, make the phone call well worth the money. The other thing is they have, they have such a database of what, what these um, medications and, and foods and things like that, what, what the limits are for our animals. That it, it's, and they can also direct your veterinarian, believe it or not, in specific protocols because they're all different. You also should never assume, as we go through this list, you should never assume, I know people have, sometimes they will have you initiate vomiting, right? Which you would never do, we never put peroxide in a cat. They, people use peroxide in dogs to make, them, to make them vomit up something. Don't ever assume that that's the right thing to do until you talk to them because certain things, believe it or not, not all things, one, will mix well with it, and two, should be brought up, okay? So again, the phone call is very, very important, okay? All right, so next item up on the list. So medications for both, both cats and dogs. We see it, it's been on the rise. Uh, it could be some of the highest um, it, it, that they see, you know, sometimes some years one, one and two uh, that may, may make up as much as a third of our, our call, phone calls to the poison control. So these things definitely are on the rise and can, can, be, can be really, you know, uh, tough on, on, on our little ones, so always err on the side of caution and call. So Bonnie, Bonnie asks, as we're talking about initiating vomiting in dogs, are there any other ways to induce vomiting in dogs besides hydrogen peroxide? At home, Bonnie, not really, okay? The veterinarians have some things. <laughs> the veterinarians have some um, some ways that we can do it, uh, but not at not at home. And so, and again, never in cats, right? Um, and never without being directed to do it, because again, you can you can do more harm than good that way sometimes. All right, all right. Let's see what Tasha. When I adopt my pup Salem from Pride Rock Rescue. Calling poison control is actually in the adoption contract. That's fantastic. I mean, you know, it is, again, it's something that everyone, having a number for poison control as a pet owner should be, just like we had poison control for the children on the fridge, same thing. Matt, you know, on the fridge, in your phone, you should have the number ready because it is well worth it. And I, I, I don't know what the exact fee is. I think last time I checked, it's $60, something like that. It might have gone up a little bit. But I do think that, it, again, it is well worth the peace of mind to do that. And they can direct you whether you have to get right in if it's at night or on a weekend and your veterinarian's not open. They can direct you to what to do initially and do you have to go to the emergency clinic or is it something that you, know, that you don't. So it's, that, is, that is very important, okay? One of, the other, one of the other, I think, common items, things that we see fall into the food category, right? For both dogs and cats, okay? And this has also changed over the years since I've been practicing, uh, seeing certain things kind of rise. Okay, um, for instance, you know, you I've I've had I've had dogs get onto. I had um, one of my favorite little dogs, my favorite little dachshund, literally climbed up on a bookshelf and ate seven uh, protein bars that had dark chocolate in them and got like three shelves up. How, how we did it, we, we don't know. 
but will there's a way, right? And uh, had to then had to go and say it was on a it was on a weekend, of course, and had to go into the emergency clinic because. Uh, you know, the dog could have gotten significantly ill. So, so even things like that, there's a lot more of those things around. So you have to keep, you have to keep food items in cabinets. You have to keep them off the counters. You have to keep them in pantries and things. Very, very important to keep them away. Um, obviously both for, um, for both, but primate, this is something that we see much more in dogs, right? Grapes and raisins. Okay. And again, something they can cause serious kidney issues with, with our guys, all right? And something that is, you know, again, having some grapes, have them in a little bowl right next to the, to the chair or something. Mo, you know, cats, cats obviously can get, can, some cats, like I have a cat that will eat anything, so you have to be careful. But we do see this more in dogs, and we do, um, and, and it does not take a lot of them. So don't ever assume with a grape or raisin that they've eaten a few of them and they're gonna be, and that's fine. You should call. Call poison control or call your veterinarian if it's during the day or during business hours. That, which, that, should, be, that should be a immediate call. And obviously with grapes, they're raisins, right? So um, both of them, neither one they, they can tolerate. Another thing, you know, I think one thing that again, both cats and dogs, um, and something we see oftentimes with with more in dogs, but certainly with cats, because th this this item can be in other things is onions. Okay, I, I think a lot of people belittle um, onions or don't know that they're toxic in amounts. Onions actually can cause anemias, believe it or not, in dogs. Okay, I, I, I've I've had I've had dogs that have come in. Um, I had a dog that one time came in because. They were having a picnic and they had a whole bag of like Sabrett's onions to put on the hot dogs at the picnic and the dog ate the entire bag and ended up getting anemic. And so, and, and remember, even like things like onion powder, right, it can be toxic. So sometimes in sick cats, we'll feed them baby food, okay? So you have to always look and make sure it's not flavored because in, in a little bit larger amounts or for feeding that a couple days, you could run into an issue. So you have to be careful and always look. You know, some people will let let their dogs have some they, some soup. They made soup to let them have some soup, which you have to be careful about. But they don't realize, well, I had onions in the chicken soup. And so that, so it's just always, it's just kind of always before you do anything, just kind of think, is there anything in here potentially? And we, you know, we try to not give our guys people food to begin with, right? Uh, the other big one, and this is primarily dogs, is, is sugar-free gum that has xylitol in it, okay? This is something that we have seen we have seen this um, rising a lot, right? Dog, it, even from a kid's room, the kid has, has gum on their nightstand or, you know, packs on the ground or even, even um, in houses where somebody might have it in a bag or a pocketbook that's open and a dog will go in and take it out and chew the gum. Xylitol can do a couple things. Xylitol can be very dev devastating. It can do a couple things. One is the immediate danger is it can cause very serious low blood sugar, hypoglycemia. And that's the immediate danger of what can happen with it. And s sometimes to the point of seizures, okay? So if they get into that, it's very important that you seek, that you call and you seek help very quickly, okay? And then, then there can be lingering effects of that, things like liver failure and things. So that's one, you know, you, in our house, we try not to have that in our house because you never know if, you know, someone's going to leave a pack of gum or a piece of gum or something, you know, somewhere on the counter or get into a bag. So we try to avoid that. Or if it is, it's, it's put far away. All right. Hey, Barry, thanks for checking in. Hi, Stephanie. How was your day, Dr. Ulrich? Still going or are you, uh, are you done for the day? Yeah, so Loretta, garlic as well. It's a, it's a good question. I think garlic... It, in high doses can bother them, yes, you're right, because it is in the same family. Um, it is something, again, in, it, it's, it is dose dependent for sure, okay? All right, so here's the, here's the next one we're gonna talk about is the, is the one that, um, that everyone knows about um, across the board, but I think sometimes there's a, there's a couple, there's always something to talk about and that's chocolate, right? coming into Easter, okay? And so this is a big one, right? Baskets out, chocolate bunnies, all sorts of chocolate things. And, you know, 
dogs, cats, to get into a basket. Uh, the other thing about Easter baskets, let's not forget that artificial grass, you gotta be very careful with cats in the house because those can act the same as, as act like string. Uh, sometimes, you know, they're making more and more of that kind of plastic artificial grass. And certainly they, cats do love to eat it, like they like to eat tinsel and you have to be careful. So be super careful with that. We, we have to be in our house because our, our cats are all over the place. So chocolate is, there's two compounds in chocolate that, that animals don't tolerate, our, our little furry friends don't tolerate well. Uh, theobromide and caffeine, both are stimulants. Uh, the one thing I think some people don't always realize is these are, the concentration of these vary greatly between milk chocolate and dark chocolate, okay? So they're much higher they're much, much higher. It, as the, the more concentration of chocolate, the more dark the chocolate gets, the higher these get. So things like cocoa powder, I've had, I've had dogs, believe it or not, go into cabinets and take out those old school tins of the cocoa powder and get that little lid off of them and, and spread it around and eat it. Uh, the semi-sweet chocolate and then dark chocolate, right? So milk chocolate has the least in it. And and a lot of times if they eat candy, they'll eat candy, say, you know, a peanut butter cup that's wrapped in milk chocolate. Or, so even the coating on there, so they're not solid chocolate. One of the, I mean, Hershey Kisses are one of the biggest ones that I see because they'll get into a bag and the foil can be an issue too. So you have to be careful of that. But the the vast majority of these guys that, that are exposed to this do well, but it is always dosed on. And, and, and most of them end up with some sort of gastrointestinal signs especially but it's it's this is another one and that you just can't assume that if they eat a certain amount of candies that they're going to be okay i think always a phone call on this one as well just if nothing else to alleviate and to talk about to alleviate your your concerns and to talk about what uh, what you can do as far as to abate some of the gi signs right and then you have a lot of times wrappers that are ingested with this you have the foil uh, from the Hershey Kisses, which can do mechanical damage to the intestines. So, anyway. So, chocolate is one everybody knows, but I think, you know, the mo most of the time, my experience has been has that the dogs um, and cats will can get into the, most of the time it's milk chocolate. But, dark chocolate, again, on the rise. More people are buying dark chocolate, so you have to be careful. All right? Let's see who else is checking in. Oh, Steph, I bet that, that soup is good. Uh, Heather. How are you, Heather? Oh, digestive system studying, huh? I hope it's going well. I hope it is going well. All right. Is it true that grapes will turn a dog's stomach over, or is that a myth? So, good question, Nicole. And really, look, if so... When, you, when you're talking about turning a dog's stomach over, what you're talking about is gastric dilation. Okay, so what has to happen, it's, it's really the term, that they'll, talk, they'll talk about bloat, okay? And what has to happen with a, um, bloat can happen at really any time from any, it, it really, it's, it's really a buildup of gas. And most of the time, believe it or not, Nicole, it's idiopathic. You don't necessarily know the cause. Now, sometimes we, we can identify a cause because an animal will, will eat something um, and, you know, either then go run around or they'll eat something, you know, di untoward that they're not supposed to eat. So it's not necessarily that grapes will cause that, but they any, any sort of dietary indiscretion can cause to a increase in, in uh, gas, and then what happens is the stomach can blow up, and that could, that's as true an emergency as you can get. Um, let's see. Hey, Sarah, how are you? Oh, thanks for checking in. Cool. Um, Jennifer, aren't there some of those sugar alcohols and some peanut butters as well? Yeah, I mean, sugar, sugar is not our, Jennifer, sugar is not our, um, our pets friends either they cannot they cannot process uh, high amounts of sugar in um, you know it's we're, we're talking about chocolate but you know they certainly can have uh, untoward effects from even just getting into things you know jelly beans and and high sugar things so yeah you do have to be careful of things like that for sure hey Geraldine thanks for checking in 
Gerald, my daughter, I just want to tell you that my daughter did get some of your product for the cats that arrived yesterday. I think she took a picture and sent it to you guys. So our, cat, uh, our cats loved it. All right. Also, Jennifer, uh, also people don't think about, well, people don't think about salt. Is it really, it's really bad, is really bad for our fur babies, just like it is bad for us, right? Yeah, and, and you know, the, the, one of the reasons, Jennifer, why I talk to people often about not giving people food, okay, to our animals is just, is just that reason, because what we don't realize is we spice, we, you know, we spice our food, uh, some people fairly dramatically, others less, but we put spices in our food that can, you know, again, you have, you have say you're cooking with something and you're putting onion powder and salt in it. Well, you can't then have your cat licking out of the bowl of soup. That you just can't do that. So you're you're right. We don't think about that sometimes, and that was what I was saying earlier. Sometimes we just don't think about the components. They're like, well, it's just it's just chicken soup. Well, yeah, but there's onions and onion powder, or there's or we put a lot of salt in it, and yeah, salts salt high. A lot of salt's not good for people either, and it's not good for for our little buddies. Yeah, Russell. So we are we were working our way towards the uh, essential oils. One of the things on the list, okay? Um, peppermint oils. Yeah. So the essential oils are another thing, okay? That are dose dependent, okay? And so there are instances where certain percentages are okay and applicable, but. I, you know, you don't want to just, you know, if you have, obviously have cats or things, you don't want it to be just have a big um, uh, oil burner on there that they can get up and, and get into and smell because it can cause them things. It can cause them respiratory things. It can cause them kidney stuff. So yeah, in higher doses is absolutely, so you have to be careful. There are certain applications where we can use them in, in you know, at certain percentages and it's safe to do. Okay. Good question. I have a question about what helps when they do eat things like furniture and clothes. What can you do to help them pass these items so it doesn't hurt them? Diana, it's a great question and there's not, you have to be careful, okay, when, and, and this is obviously, this goes to our dietary indiscretion more than toxins, okay, although dyes in, dyes in furniture and dyes that are in clothes can be harmful as well, okay, but we're talking about mechanical obstructions. Okay, and that's what you're talking about. And it's, you know, some people will say, I've heard people that said, well, you know, I, uh, you know, my, my, my dog chewed a sock and tore up a sock and ate half of it. So I gave some olive oil and some bread and things like that. You have to be very careful. And there's not one thing that you can say at home that you can do if they eat something like that to help. Okay, I'm very, if you know that they've eaten if they've eaten some um, some cloth or they've eaten, it really is a good idea to bring them into the veterinarian. At, at the very least, they can take a look at them, feel their belly and things. You have to monitor them. Uh, usually we do recommend if they, do, if they go on an eating spree like that, that we do x-ray them and get a baseline because we want to know where these things are, right? And oftentimes you can identify you know, you'll see, you'll see a, you know, what looks like a cloth substrate sitting in the stomach, or it may be sometimes you, um, you can, you'll identify it and you'll see that, that there's items in the colon and the rest of it's empty, meaning that it's gotten down to the end. So I don't generally recommend people change or do something else to help it because you can actually hurt it because if they're obstructed and you put a bunch of things into them, um, you can, it, you know, it can, it can actually be more harm than good. Okay. Yeah, Michael, obviously, you know, we're, we're talking large quantities, but certainly, okay, um, you know, our, our animals don't need, um, don't need high amounts of salt, okay? All right, let's see what Barrett. So a friend's dog would not eat her dog food, so I sprinkled some olive oil on it and she gobbled it up. Are there any other oils that are good for dogs? Well, I mean, the, the, the obvious answer are things like fish oils and things, right? Um, because they can contain a lot of fatty acids. There are some oils you have to, you know, there, you don't want to just go and use any oils because, um, 
some oils that are very tasteless, sometimes you have to worry about aspiration, okay? So I think another, obviously, another great oil to use would be some sort of a cold water fish oil for fatty acid supplementation. It, they, and clearly there's, there's a good amount of flavor that a lot of times they like, okay? All right. All right, let's, let's, let's uh, move on a bit and then we'll come back to the questions, okay? All right, Easter's coming, right? Um, so we, you know, maybe not as much this year where we're doing large family gatherings, but oftentimes Easter's a time when people get together, people may bring um, flowers, it's very common, right? You have to be very careful with uh, cats and dogs, okay? Flowers is primary, you know, kind of falls over onto the um, cat side most commonly, right? This is one of the biggest toxin problems with cats, Easter lilies, right? Um, lilies are lilies are very dangerous, are very toxic to cats, and something that we want to avoid altogether. So, if you have you have uh, cats in your house, no lilies. Don't bring them in. They 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 really. It is something that is extremely extremely toxic to to our cats. So, just remember that. And remember that if you're bringing a bouquet of flowers, if if you have a bouquet of flowers. Oftentimes they're all mixed, and you may not know the flowers in, in, in there. And there are, a, a, you know, there are a um, a fair amount that, at, at the very least, are are GI toxic. Okay, there are if you if you look on the internet, there are some great sites, and you just search, um, you know, safe plants for cats and dogs. There are some great sites that can show you what they can, um, what you can have in your house. What I found in our house is even the. <laughs> I wish I had a picture. Even the safe plants that we have in our house, uh, we have a particular cat, Roxy, that is uh, that gets everywhere, even places that you would never think she could get up to, and um, she really does uh, decimate. So we unfortunately can't have a lot of uh, plants in in our house. All right. So take a look at that list and just be careful. But again, lilies, um, no good. Don't have them. All right, let's see. Again, Yanni, so you're asking about nebulizer with uh, eucalyptus. I think you have to be very, very careful. And I, I assume you're talking about, are you talking about a, um, a room one or actual ne a nebulizer or, um, or, or just one that you're using in the room and putting eucalyptus in? I think you have to be, again, you have to be very, very careful with that because they, sometimes the pets will go right up to those. All right, and I think you want to try to avoid that. Yeah, they do, Mary, and they have a list as well. You're right, ASPCA. All right, let's see. All right, so we talked about plants. One of the other thing, things that we're seeing on the rise and something that is really worth talking about is household, um, you know, cleaners, toxicants, right? Obviously, during COVID, there has been such a swell in home improvement uh, projects, right? And so the, so of course, the more, in, the, more how, the more work people are doing on the inside of their house, the more, the, the higher the possibility that our pets are gonna be able to come in contact with various items, right? Obviously, we know any any cleaners, you know, and any any sort of chemical cleaner should always be childproof capped away, you know, stored away in a in a in a, in a cabinet or a, or a garage or somewhere where they don't have access to it. You have to be careful. Things like mopping and things, pets can go and then lick the floor afterwards, and at the very least, they can cause topical issues in the mouth. But it sometimes doesn't take much, especially if it's a heavy, you know, if you're doing something with bleach or something, even even the fumes can bother them. So you have to be really careful. And things you wouldn't even think about, right? Paint, sp spackle. You know, they're just doing different things to the, to the, you know, even just painting the walls. You know, I, I can't tell you how many times I've had animals that have come in that have gotten paint on them, right? And what happens if they get paint on them, they, they'll go to lick it off, okay? So, you know, none of that, uh, you have to be really careful. Like we said, very cautious and just always, always think, 
you're always kind of thinking it's like child proofing a house it's the same thing you always have you have to pet proof the house you have to know you have to know that they're kind of always looking to get it. and and really especially cats cats love to get into places and get into cabinets and you know explore under things and so it's uh it, it's 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 really um it's really important prevention key right so two things prevention and having the poison control hotline handy so you can make a phone call if you need to all right let's see who else what other all right let's see Jerilyn um, yeah yeah thanks how giving the your pets people foods made with onion actually harm the pet it seems no one understands the physical impact on their pet. I see this all too often and want it to end. Yeah, and Gerilyn, we talked about that a little earlier, and I think part of it is just is just realizing that I think as when we talk about not giving people food to our pets, okay, it's multifactorial. All right, one is it rarely is beneficial to them at all. Okay. Again, we spice our foods. There's things in our foods we don't even remember in there, um, and there, there can be a lot of harmful things in it. It can elicit, at the very least, GI disorders in our, our animals, you know, from gastroenteritis to things like pancreatitis, right? So just on that, it also can make them, just on a basis of, with it, it just on a very um, simple basis, can make them picky, right? Um, if we start by giving them, you know, um, part of our dinner, they're going to want that. You know, it's, it's learned behavior. So it's, it's really important. And like I said, and, and we touched on it a little bit earlier, Geraldine, is that, you know, a lot of people don't, don't think. They're like, oh, well, there's a few onions in the, in the soup, but I, I didn't finish all of it. And, you know, I'll just let the, the dog have some or the cats drink it out of the bowl. It'll be fine. And, you know, it may not. So I think if you just set out and say that you really, you know, your, your goal is to not not give people food to your pets you you can save yourself all right a, a, a lot and save them and it's important all right all right nicole our dog has developed an interest in the soil of our house plants he loves to sneak off and stick his nose and mouth in the pot is it dangerous well it could be dangerous if there's fertilizer there in there which a lot of house plants will have in that soil unless you potted them yourself um and um, so then for them to, some will eat it. It's one thing if they go in and kind of sniff around, but it's another thing a lot of times if they, you know, if they get in there and take a mouthful, they lick the dirt off their nose. So it can be, you have to be careful. You have to be careful. Oh, Diana, your dog ate your new couch. I'm very sorry. I wish I could say that I have never had that happen to me, um, but I have. And I've seen a lot, you're not alone. I've seen a lot of uh, my patients and my clients go through everything couches chairs walls sometimes sheetrock things like that so <laughs> so yeah Marianne I'd imagine you're I'm, I'm sure safety is a priority in your house for sure well you have to keep Georgia safe right very important yeah and certainly like you know again Marianne if you're diluting vinegar out and using that um, and and washing it that 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 also can be a safe alternative. Hello, John Stratton. Thanks for checking in. Just, did you just uh, just tune in, John? You've been you're busy. Anyway, all right. Let's go to our next one. And this is a big one for both. Okay, um, rodenticides, right? Rat, rat bait, rat poison, and they fall into a couple different categories. This is something that we see in both dogs and cats, okay? And there's an interesting piece to this. What, so, you know, obviously you always, you have to be careful about putting any sort of, when you have small animals, putting any sort of rodenticide or rodent bait, even if it's around your house where your pets can't get to on the outside or in a garage or think, places, because, believe it or not, if your cat or dog, if a, if a mouse gets into enough of it, a mouse or God, a rat or a mouse, and they then catch that and eat that, they can get it secondarily through that. So I think a lot of people don't know that, right? There's a lot of people think, well, if they can't get to the bait itself, 
then then it'd be okay. But actually, they can get it secondarily through, again, through some of the rodents. So you have to be extremely cautious with it. Okay, and there's a couple different types, right? One of the things you'll you'll hear about a lot about is vitamin D toxicity in animals. You're like, well, vitamin D toxicity. Well, one is obviously if they you know if they get high enough dosages that are into a bottle of vitamin D, okay. But the other thing is they use uh, cholecalciferol. That's vitamin D. They use that in some rodent baits, and so the uptick in vitamin D toxicity, which can cause kidney failure in animals, is actually due to a lot of these newer rodenticides using that. Um, you know, to 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 affect the rodents, okay. And the uh, and the classic with rodent bait is things like brodificon, which is a long-acting um, anticoagulant, okay. So one you know one one experience kind of that, that I've had over the years is that a lot of times people may not know that their animals gotten a rodent bait, but they may. This is a key sign if you ever see. Because those anticoagulants cause bruising, okay, and a lot of those are delayed. So first of all, if you know they get into any any of the any of those poisons, you call you call poison control right away, okay. But um, they a lot of times if they don't see them eat it, what they'll see is they'll kind of look and they they'll they'll be petting their belly and they'll see a small bruise on them and they're kind of like oh did they bang themselves? But then they might see another one. If you ever see bruising on your animal and you don't know the um, and and it just kind of crops up, it's 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 you want to you want to bring them in for um, to a veterinarian right away, whether it's the emergency clinic or your veterinarian because it can. There's obviously other things that can cause it, but. Bruising can bruising out of nowhere can be serious on any level, um, but it also may mean that they get into uh, into some of the some of the rodent bait. All right, uh, let's see who else is checking in here. All right, Ashley, can it be harmful if dogs only eat cat food, and how would you discourage that? Okay, good question. So, dogs eating cat food, so. It, Dogs can eat cat food. You wouldn't feed it to them, okay? And you don't want them to eat it. One is it's it's much higher generally in fat, okay, than a lot of the dog foods. So what what can happen is obviously if they continue to kind of get into the cat's dish, they can put weight on them that you don't want on them. Um, cats cannot eat cats cannot eat dog food as a, as a, things like that if they're not eating their their own diet if they're going to the bowl because cats need taurine and um, cat food is 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 uh, it's in higher levels in cat food, okay? So, but it's not necessary. I mean, it's not it, it's not necessarily harmful, but there are things in it that are not balanced for them. It's not made for them. And how you discourage that is, like in in our house, our cat food is places where the dogs can't get to, okay? Um, it's elevated places. It's in parts of the house that they don't go to um, because they do love, dogs love, unfortunately, they love two things. They love cat food, and unfortunately, they love cat poop, right? Uh, two things that they will seek out readily. Um, so you have to just make sure that they uh, that food is away from where they can get to, all right? So, uh, Jimmy, let's see. Are there any vegetables I should avoid giving my golden retriever? He likes all of them: broccoli, cauliflower, carrots, green beans, celery. That whole list that you just that you just uh, gave right there, Jimmy, is absolutely fine. Um, you know, obviously, we already talked about onions, right? Um, the other thing is, um, you know, there when you stick with it, if you stick with that list that you have then you you should be you should be good now remember too even even you know obviously and dogs are you know omnivores right so they can't eat that but you have to remember everything that you're giving them that's outside of their normal food also has some calories like carrots in particular have more calories more sugars and things than green beans right or celery Okay, so some animals can get gassy from certain ones, but that list that you have is pretty good. But remember, you just can't give as as much as you want because even those will have have calories, and you know, so you have to be careful and judicious when you when you when you give them. All right, avocado you want to stay away from. Avocado is it's not as it, 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 you can get GI signs in dogs, but it is something that 
is um, like in birds and horses can be really toxic. Not as toxic to dogs, but you don't want to give them. You don't want to give the dogs avocado. All right, Barrett said my dog eats origin dog food, but I mix uh, turkey, sweet potatoes, carrots, sardines, or salmon. Right, so some cold water fish, you're getting some fatty acids there. And again, let's remember, if we're adding things to the food, we have to adjust their food calorie-wise based on the fact that we know we're adding things in, right? Really important. Because even those those things are good for them, and you have, you know, obviously sweet potatoes fine unless they're allergic to them. But, um, you know, complex carb, you get fatty acids, you get omegas with the sardine salmon, you just have to be, you have to be careful because obviously you can overfeed them. All right, Andrea, let's see. My 11-month-old uh, house panther has been diagnosed with asthma. Is there anything in the house that would aggravate his condition? Well, yeah, so they can, similar to people, right? Air quality is a big thing um, with, with asthmatics, okay? And they can have allergies, dust mites, mold spores, things like that. So air purifiers are really good if you can get them. Um, they're good for people too, but they're, they're really good for those guys. Um, it, it, it's very, you know, it, asthma in these guys is, is, is very similar to the human in the sense that different triggers, different allergens can trigger it. Different times of the year can be worse depending on what's in the air. So very good question, Andrea. Very good question. Yeah. Yes, Aunt Loretta, absolutely. Ant traps can be dangerous. Um, you know, one of the, and, and you know, you'll see oftentimes that you know, someone will call me and say, oh, that my dog chewed it up. Um, it generally is, you, you know, you want to make sure, again, and this time of year is, is a time that we get more calls on those, right? Um, because this time of year, a lot of times it changes season, people, the ants start coming in and people see more ants. All right. Yeah, so Geraldine, we did talk, actually we mentioned that earlier, um, that it does. Onion do can cause, actually in both dogs and cats, it causes uh, anemia, okay? It's, it's, it actually causes, you know, some, it, it causes a specific type of anemia, so when you look at it on a cellular level, there'll actually be bullseye, some of these cells look like bullseyes. Um, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's wild, but yes, it does, and that's why we talked um, I think it was before you came on, but we 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 talked about that earlier. Uh, let's see, Tasha. I visited a farm once that used birth control pellets instead of poison to help the rat population. Oh yeah, that's interesting, Tasha. I've never heard of that. That is uh, that is interesting though. Oh, <laughs> thanks, Geraldine. Thank you very much. That's very kind of you. Very kind. Yeah, and Jimmy. Yeah, you know, giving them. Uh, the, the, on that list that you had, um, if they tolerate it, certainly as, as treats, a little carrot, some broccoli, uh, green beans, things like that, absolutely fine. Um, you know, again, just at, like everything else, um, just make sure you don't overdo it, right? Hey, Candace, I hope, I hope you and Bronson are having a great week too. I'm having a great, I'm having a great week. I'm getting to talk to you guys. It's, the time flies when we're doing this. I, I'll tell you, I just looked up, it's 50 minutes in. It's unbelievable how fast. Yeah, Marianne. You know, yeah, and so, again, it's all, you know how we talk, um, depending, we, we talk different subjects every week. We talk about a whole bunch of, of various things, but one of the things that uh, we always stress is, remember, these guys are all individuals, right? And so what's good for one dog or one cat may not be good for the next one. And, you know, even in the same breeds, they're all individuals. So you take them as a veterinarian, you take every, you know, not all, I, you know, if someone, if, if someone asks me what I recommend for their eight-year-old golden retriever, I could have two eight-year-old golden retrievers and two different families. They have two different, they're two totally separate um you know, personalities, two totally separate medical conditions. So what's good for one may not be good for the other. Absolutely. Yep, Candace, we talked about Easter lilies. We, we mentioned that before. Um, for both, you know, you just, uh, I, unfortunately, very beautiful. Have animals in the house, I, you keep them out. You have to. You have to. Absolutely have to. You're right, Candace. All right. 
So, you know, the other thing too is one of the, so just, and even some veterinary products, you know, that you have at home, chewable things, you got to remember, you know, we, we like to make, veterinarians like to make things chewable and flavored because they're easier to give, right? Who loves trying to pill an animal, especially a cat, right? So, you know, a lot of times they're making these things chewable. So you have to remember, key, right? They're chewable, they're scented, and if they like them and they eat them out of your hand, you have to keep them away because what they get once a day, they can't generally eat 60 of them, right? So you have to be really, really careful about that, all right? So that's another thing. Just, just remember that even the things that go home with you from the veterinarian, you do not want you do not want them to get into. You know, one of the other things that I, it, it kind of an honorable mention on this list, and I think we've gone through the bulk of the most common things, and you guys have had really wonderful, wonderful questions. Um, and we've got some more, so we'll get to those. Uh, remember too, and this isn't, I don't see it as common, but it can be a real issue, is raw bread dough, right? May not think about it, you know, just this raw bread dough, but what can happen if they eat it is twofold. One, it can become a mechanical obstruction, right? So they eat this dough, it gets into their stomach, is sitting there, and it's in, a, you know, a warm, dark place, so it can really expand and cause bloating and a, and a mechanical obstruction. But the other problem is it can also produce ethanol and it can intoxicate and cause acid base problems and everything with the, with, the, with the animals, mostly dogs in this case, right? So it's something to always think about. This is again, you know, something that we might not even have talked about even two years ago, but a lot of people are homesteading, right? A lot of people are making, making their own bread, me included. Um, and so, you just, you know, you have the bread, it's on the counter, you go and you go for a walk or something, the dog's in the kitchen, it pulls it down, it eats it, right? So again, it, like we do in my house, I mean, I, I'm, I'm a big, I, I tend to be a bit of a safety nut job and maybe overdo it, okay? Um, but I'd rather be that way and not have, and, and even then you still can have, so you never know because animals are very unpredictable, right? But you just have to kind of always know with what you're working with, if you're working, if you're making bread or you're painting your walls or you're, you're spackling or you're just, you don't want to leave anything out because guaranteed somebody's going to cut so one of your friends. I mean, we've got, we've got animals walking around all over our house, right? So if you do something like that, and I, I can guarantee you if I leave something, if I leave a little tiny container of paint open, one of my animals is definitely going to put their nose in it. There is no way around it. So you just can't. You can't, unfortunately. Oh, thank you, Marianne. That's really nice. I really appreciate it. It's always good to talk to you. Hopefully I can meet you in, in Georgia at some point. Thank you, good fish. Right, right, right. Of course. Yep. <laughs> so any John Strat wants to know if there's any plants that may discourage my dogs from getting in and mauling my garden. Um, well, I think more, I think, you know what would be better, um, maybe just a higher fence around the garden. I, I've been in your garden, it's kind of a low fence, and they can get over it. So we don't, I don't think, there's not too many that will discourage because I also know your dogs and I think they would dig at most things. So I think a higher fence would be my, my suggestion to you. Let me know if that works. <laughs> Um, Patty, hi Dr. Chris, if I turn my back, Munchkin will try to drink coffee. <laughs> Do you think that she was used to uh, you having a, um, a Dunkachino in the parking lot at Dunkin' Donuts? It's, you don't want to have them drink your, and you know what, you probably, Patty, it's more probably for the milk in there, okay, that taste, or creamer, um, but there's caffeine in, there's, ca uh, there's caffeine in coffee, so yeah, you, you want to avoid it. Not that they're drinking a lot, but again, it goes back to the you should keep them away from that stuff because it's not natural for them to to uh, to drink it. So keep them away. Sarah Hopkins, my puppies, my puppy shreds my hosta plants. Where the deer repellent hurt them. You know, I Sarah, it's a good question. I don't know. I know there's different deer repellents. So I'm not sure what's in the one you're using, um, but you can certainly message me and tell me, and I'll, I'll let you know. All right. 
Um, I'll tell you. So this is this is another is a story about my dog, right? And so we had um, we we have hostas right in our back deck, a whole row of hostas, and it came and they've been there. Obviously, they come up every year, and they've been there for years. And we um, last summer we had we had just recently adopted another dog, Sadie, who I talk about on the show all the time, and my wife got four brand new gorgeous hostas to put in. Okay, and she set, you know, she she uh, she eyed out where they were going to go, and she put them in the places to get in the pots and in right along the bed. And okay, so now she goes in to get her her gardening gloves and a shovel to put them in. And she was in the garage for five minutes and came back, and they were all shredded, every single one of them, in like five minutes. Okay, so um, they they really I, I don't hostas probably are not in our future in there. Um, it's uh, we're, we're currently trying to brainstorm to see what we can do because Sadie likes to just tear through there no matter what we do and maybe we can go to a little bit of a fence John like I could follow my own advice as I did with you but um, it has become a little bit of a problem because it's just dirt right now so um, have to work on our landscaping uh, but the weather's better so we will uh, Colleen, hi doctor. I wonder if in the future cast you can talk about pancreatitis in dogs. Absolutely, Colleen. And um, it is a good subject. It is common and there's different types, right? There's acute and there's chronic. So um, yeah, it's a good idea. We'll, we'll definitely, um, we'll put it in the rotation at some point, certainly. You're absolutely welcome. All right. All right, guys. Well, I think really that's the bulk of it. I, I have to tell you, I think as always, um, the questions and the interaction has been great. You guys bring every week, you bring wonderful um, knowledge and questions. And I, and I, um, <laughs> I, I just, I just saw this. So Jennifer says maybe a dog trainer, John, as well. And if you get one, do me a favor, then stop, then stop over. Uh, come through the fence. We could train all of our dogs together. That'll work. Um, anyway, I, I really appreciate the interaction, guys. I, I appreciate the questions. Um, yeah, Candace, we can do that as well. I think that's that that would be a good show as well to talk about CPR for our animals because you know it may not it may not ever be needed, but if it is, it would be good to it would be good to know. So that's another one. And you know we. we just uh, stay tuned for some improvements to the uh, the camera and the set. We're working into that, so we're going to have uh, a a better range to do demonstrations and things like that. Have guests on. We've got a, we've got big plans for the AOV, so we'll uh, we'll keep uh, trying you know keep trying to improve as long as you guys keep tuning in and asking these great questions. So thank you very much. Oh, Diana, thanks for tuning in. I really, uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you, Heather. Um, good luck studying. Thank you very much. All right, guys, have a safe and healthy and nice weekend. All right. Um, and we will see you next week. Next week is National Pooper Scooper Week. So we're going to talk about, about uh, all things poop next week. A lot of, lot of, lot of info, a lot of info. All right. Everyone have a great, great weekend. Thanks for tuning in, guys. I really appreciate it. Thanks.